One of the items that we're going to talk about is actually the assembly language. Um, and this is important because this is the language that actually um, works directly with the CPU. And we think about these various languages such as Python, Perl, PHP, HTML. The assembly language deals with the actual hardware. It's the low level programming language. This particular language is, is key, especially when you think about like security and stuff like that and understanding how do these um, vulnerabilities get exploited at the hardware level. So oh, this right here is just displaying what human readable machine language is. And so computers, you know, they compute items or they read items such as zeros and ones. And that's what you see on this particular line. You see zero, 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 one, 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 one. And then as humans, we look at symbols, right? So we see letters and we see numbers and stuff like that. Um, and then, so you have various assemblers and the assembler that we're going to be using is the NASM assembler. Um, and that's, it's NASM. That's the assembler that we'll be downloading using on our Linux machines. Um, so basically, assembler is basically in a program that turns symbols into machine instructions. Um, and so you have um, mnemonics for opcodes, you have labels for memory locations. Um, and then, of course, it, here is saying you have a close correspondence between symbols and instruction sets. And so uh, it's and the only issue with the assemblers is if you get used to one particular assembler, uh, maybe NASM or I can't remember the other assemblers, but you use another assembler. The actual coding itself on the assemblers um, vary from assembler to assembler. So note that. And remember, these items can be hardware specific too, where you may have to kind of understand and look up some of the commands that to drive these particular items as they may be different. All right, so right here shows an example of assembly program. Um, what you see with the actual um, semicolon, those are comments. That's how you do comments in uh, uh, assembly. Uh, you know, in Python, it's the pound pound, and C++, it's the two forward slashes. Uh, so there's different methods of doing comments. You know, even in bash scripting, you have the pound pound for the comment. So you see these items are comments, and then from here, it's kind of showing, this is, you know, this is just giving an example of how an assembly language program looks. Very different than what we've talked about um, with Python. All right, so the LC3 assembly language syntax, so basically each line of the program is one of the following is either an instruction an assembler directive or a comment um, you have white space these are the items between symbols and then the cases are ignored then you have comments in here just saying that the comments um, you have the semicolon and those are also also ignored so here is showing that the um, particular format for instruction is you have the label opcode operands and then comments and so the label and the comments are optional um, but what's mandatory is the opcode and operands. Those particular items are required. So imagine having a statement, a, a print statement, and then you have a comment that says this particular statement is printing this, or you're assigning a variable, and this particular statement is assigning variable X, um, whatever value. And so technically, you don't need those comments. But from a good developer standpoint, you want to have comments in there. So if an individual takes your particular code and they're trying to see exactly what the program is doing, they're able to um, do that without having to worry about, um, you know, what is a particular program going to do and stuff like that. So it's it's just it's better in terms of coding practices. All right, so here we're going to talk about opcodes and operands. So basically, opcodes are reserved symbols that correspond to the LC3 instructions. Um, and so some examples are add and LD. LD is load. So we are actually, so this is just items and you have LDR and then you have various operands, you have the registers uh, specified by RN, uh, where the, uh, where, is, where is the registered number, you have the numbers. Uh, these are indicated by the decimal or hex. You have the label, so this is the symbolic name of the memory location. Um, these items separated by commas and then you have number order type correspond to instruction format. And so below is an example where you see how these items actually look in towards the instruction format. And that's what you see at the example below. All right, labels and comments. Um, so labels are placed at the beginning of the line. Um, they assign a symbolic name to the address corresponding to the line. And so the example you see, you see loop add R1 comma R2 comma number sign um, one. And so that's what you see right there with that particular example. And so here's just saying that anything after the semicolon is a comment um, ignored by the assembler. These are all referenced to, com to comments. Uh, basically, like I said earlier, used by the human to document and understand programs. You can also write scripts maybe to go through a particular program and pull the comments out. And you can use that for documentation as well. So you're thinking about test cases and stuff like that. And you're like, okay, I need to create a, a test case or a test 
plan for this particular code. Well, you can use those comments as kind of almost not a baseline, but you can take those comments from that particular code and say, all right, I'm gonna use these comments. This line is supposed to execute this. Well, I'm gonna test this and see if this actual line is executing this particular command. All right, assembler directives. Um, these are the pseudo operations. Um, they do not refer to operations executed by the program. These are used by the assembler. They look like instruction, but opcode starts with a dot. And so you see the opcode. So you see dot org, dot origin, dot n, dot uh, w, dot fill, dot string z. And then you have the operand, um, and you have address, n, n, and then the character string, string, string. And then to the right, it has the meaning, um, basically, what that particular meaning is for that opcode and operand. So like origin, and you have the address, so basically it's the starting address of a program. And of course, it's the end of the program. Now, one of the cool things is about this, it's some of these items are fairly easy to kind of catch on. So you know what origin means and or end and fill. So some of these items are not as complex. Uh, what I'll do is I will make sure I put a link to a cheat sheet for this. Um, on the video. So when you look at it later, you can say, oh, okay, I see what these particular opcodes or operands do. And you can have like a one or two page cheat sheet that actually assist you with understanding um, just more about assembler directives and these actual pseudo operations. All right, you have trap codes. Basically, um, this particular assembler provides pseudo instructions for each trap code. Uh, so you don't have to memorize them. So the codes you see like a halt, and out, get C, uh, put S, and so basically you have that and you have the equivalent where you have the trap 25, trap 23, trap X 21. And then, of course, you have the description um, alongside that particular trap code. Uh, style guidelines. These are basically get guidelines to improve the readability and understandability of the programs. So here just saying uh, provide a program header with the author's name, date, et cetera, the particular program. Now, when you create and do your documentation, especially your software documentation, it's important to understand who actually created this program. What date would this program create? Now, you can actually look at the date of the actual file itself. Um, but when you're talking about trying to create items such as uh, items to improve the overall quality of a particular software design or program or something like that, and you're thinking about items such as code checking and stuff like that, this is this would be good for that. Um, start labels, opcode, operands, and comments in the same column for each line. Use comments to explain what each register does. Give explanatory comment for most instructions. So basically, whenever you're given, anytime you give an instruction, you should give a comment, even if it's just printing an item. You're like, print this, or just comment, this is what's going on. Because you can't expect everyone to be a coder that looks at your code, unfortunately. So you may have a guy who does quality, or you have a security guy, you may not be a software, they're more just network focused. And maybe some of the items they do doesn't really deal with uh, machine language or assembly. And they're looking at stuff such as like PowerShell scripts and other types of scripts for automation. And they actually look at the machine code. They're like, okay, well, let me look at this particular item. I don't know NASM is or this other assembler. They look at it. What is this line supposed to do and how can I test it? Oh, this line supposed to do this. Okay, I know what test maybe I should run or how I can better um, either maybe exploit it for internal testing or uh, further harden, hardening, um, hardening of that particular um, line. They can say, okay, I can get this advice. This is how this should be hardened based upon what this should be doing actually in the code. And then here, just saying that each line needs to fit on the page, no wraparounds or um, truncations, and basically long statements need to be split, um, just so it's just pleasing for people to read. All right, so here's a sample program here. And here, just saying, uh, this is a sample program. This is just the uh, character count and assembly language. And we're actually going to do our own assembly item offline. This is just showing more, and I'll kind of explain uh, what's going on and stuff like that when we do our actual code. All right, so here's talking about the assembly uh, process right here. So basically, uh, converting the assembly file into an executable uh, object. And so here you see the assembly language program. You have the first pass, um, symbol table, second pass, and then executable image. And so here, say the first pass, they scan the image file, finds all labels, and calculate the corresponding addresses. And that's called the symbol table. And so that's what you see right here. I'm going to move my mouse so you can see. Maybe you can or can't. Yes. All right, so here you see symbol table. And then the second pass is um, converting the instructions to machine language and then using the information from the symbol table. So you see that this is used pretty much for the first and second pass, the symbol table. And then here is where the executable image is being created. All right, so here's just giving more. So first pass is gonna find the original statement. 
uh, find um, which tells us what the address is the first instruction. Uh, so basically, the initialize location counter, which keeps track of the current instruction. And then for the non empty line in the program, um, for each non empty line in the program, if the line contains a label, add a label and the LC to the um, symbol table, increment the LC, and then it'll stop when the actual end statement is reached. So here's the second pass right here. So basically for each executable assembly language statement, generate the corresponding machine language instruction. If the operand is a label, look up the address for the symbol state. Um, here's talking about potential problems, improper number or type of arguments, uh, immediate argument too large, and then address basically with more than 256 from the instructions. So basically the PC relative uh, addressing mode. So here's just talking about using uh, symbol or LC3 edit uh, windows. Like I said, we're using we're going to be using NASM. And so NASM will be the actual assembler that we use. All right, so here's talking about second pass, generating the actual machine language. So basically, for each executable um, assembly language statement, generate the corresponding machine language instruction. Um, if the operand is a label, you can look up the address. Uh, potential problems are a proper number of type of arguments. Uh, like I said, arguments are too large. And then, of course, there are more than the 256 from the instruction. So basically, the PC, uh, you can't use PC relative addressing mode. So when, I, when, I, when we go through this, you'll actually see how these files get created um, in terms of running this particular item and installing NASM and stuff like that. But we're going to talk about linking and loading, and then we'll go ahead and bring up the talk about how you install and all that stuff. So. Loading is basically the process of copying an executable image into memory. Um, as more sophisticated loaders are able to relocate images to fit into available memory, uh, must readjust branch targets, load, and store addresses, and yet linking, uh, which is the process of resolving symbols between independent object files. And then uh, you're supposed to define a object, a symbol in one module, and then use it in another. And then some notation, such as external, is used to tell the assembler that the symbol is defined in another module. And then also the linker will search symbol tables um, of other modules to resolve symbols to complete code generation before loading. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to share my uh, let's see. I'm going to share my file. Not my file, but my screen. There we go. All right, so what you see here is my elementary OS. Make that a little bigger. And so what you need to do, let me close this out. I'm going to bring up my terminal. And what you need to do is install NASM. So sudo app get install NASM. So you're going to install NASM. So there's one more time. All right, so I'm going to, let me bring this up. So that's what you see right there. All right, so I already have this file actually written up, and so I'm just going to show you quickly how does it look. So I'm going to share another item with you. So let me share this. All right, perfect. So clear. All right, 
right, so that's what you see. This is what you kind of see here. I'm actually going to do vim asm1.asm. So this is my hello world file um, that I created. And it will, we'll have to go through this, I guess, um, much more in detail. But this is kind of the hello world file I created. And so that's what you see right here. So this is just an example of how assembly looks. Um, and then you don't necessarily have to use VI um, at VI Vim to actually do this. You can do this with uh, with any other item. And so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go through this. I'm going to um, end this particular session, and then we're going to actually talk online, and we'll go through um, how to actually build this item out. So we're going to close this out. And we are going to end this session. And then for the one person that is dialed in, um, ping me via um, Google uh, Hangouts, and we'll actually bring it up, and we'll kind of go through this exercise. All right, thank you.